Hello, everybody. My name is Hannah Kay, and I'm the executive producer at Intelligence Squared. For those of you who aren't aware of Intelligence Squared, we are a London-based organization, and we stage debates, talks, and discussions on all the hot topics of the day, including politics, foreign affairs, history, tech, and culture. And if you want to find out more about us, you can go to our website at intelligencesquared.com. Now, it's been huge fun and a great honor to help organize today's event with these wonderful speakers and actors. So um, that's probably enough from, from me for now, and I'm going to hand over to our chair. She is a number one international best-selling author and founder of the Women's Prize for Fiction. Please give a warm welcome to Kate Mox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many of you here um, for this extraordinary event. Um, I don't think these books uh, could be more timely. Uh, what we're celebrating today is a pair of books written by Simon Seabag Montefiore. The first was Voices in History, uh, Speeches that Changed the World that was just out now. And earlier, uh, he published Written in History, which was Letters that Changed the World. And we're going to mix it up a little bit today. Um, Simon, as of course many of you know, apart from being on the Politburo of this uh, festival, as we now know we must call it, um, he is a prize-winning historian and novelist, a wonderful Russian trilogy of novels, but also in non-fiction, Catherine the Great and Potemkin, Young Stalin, and the wonderful Jerusalem, the biography, amongst several of his other extraordinary books. We're also today joined by three exceptional actors. Um, in the middle, Jay Danuka, who many of you will have seen in the Donmar Shakespeare trilogy of Julius Caesar, Henry IV, and The Tempest, and of course will have recently seen in the wonderful programme Cleaning Up, which was ITV. Was that the important thing to say, <laughs> that it was ITV? Um, next to Jade is Alex McQueen, a BAFTA-nominated actor. Uh, you will have seen in The Inbetweeners and the BBC's The Thick of It. And at the moment, or is about to be seen in, ladies and gentlemen, as if this was planned, The Trial of Christine Keeler. Um, yeah. Now, he is not playing the lady herself, indeed, or indeed the gentleman himself, if, if we see him as a gentleman. Um, but however, is, uh, you're the prosecution? Prosecutor. Yeah. Prosecutor. So he doesn't know if any of it was filmed here. Um, but I think there are people who might know that. And then finally, at the end, we have Natasha McElone, whose films you will know as Ronin, The Truman Show, and Solaris, um, and in the ABC drama Designated Survivor and California. I knew I wouldn't be able to say it. I skipped it, then I thought, no, go back and give her all her credits. Californication, which sounds like a Mary Poppins thing. Um, California vacation, as my children used oh, to call exactly. it. Yeah. Which actually sounds much more fun, really. And is really. about to be in Halo. And there is another Christine Keeler link in your life as well. Only that I went swimming in the pool exactly. this morning. Yes. <laughs> I feel, I feel that anyone who's been in the outdoor pool now can claim some sort of connection uh, to, to that very famous story. Um, so what we're going to do is Seabag and I are going to talk about some of the letters and mainly speeches that um, he's chosen and are going to be read by the actors. Um, and it's going to be... Well, it, it, I mean, it must have been very hard to choose which ones to do today. But just in terms of talking about the, the wonderful new book speeches and the letters, why did you decide that this was a series of books you wanted to do, and what was the purpose of publishing them now? Um, I think, you know, I mean, the, the letters is, is a, is a no-brainer. I mean, nothing beats the immediacy, the intimacy, the authenticity of a letter, um, whether it's political or a love letter or an erotic letter or a letter of, of war or peace. So that, that was the sort of first book. The second one, on the speeches, I just thought, I thought, you know, this was about a year ago, I just suddenly thought, you know, this is a time when the word, when speeches, when the discourse has really never mattered more. Our words have never been more important than they are today. And so I wanted to go back over history and look at speeches um, that have been given. I mean, never, you know, never in modern, modern British life has um, public discourse been so lacking grip um, uh, and, so, and so sort of messy, so ignorant, mm. and, and, and in a way, so dangerous. I mean, words can be so powerful, um, words can be so benign, they can be so positive, they can be an elixir, a tonic 
to heal the ills and pain and hatreds. But they can also be the poison that destroys cultures because you know, violent words lead to, vi lead to violence, as we saw in, say, Nazi Germany in the 30s. They lead to the normalization of certain modes of behavior that can destroy societies. Mm. So I thought it was very important in this book not just to have, of course, it's got all the sort of speeches you would know and you've heard of, you know, Lincoln, Elizabeth I, and Winston Churchill, of course. Um, but I also think it's very important to have um, speech to show how powerful speeches are by people who you don't think of as great orators. Mm. I mean, yes, we've got saints like um, Jesus Christ and Greta Thunberg, um, but we also have um, we also have speeches um, by Donald Trump. Um, we also have speeches by Heinrich Himmler, by Joseph Stalin, and by the Emperor Nero, who in many ways is the person who is most the most modern speaker in the book in the sense that he really he really understood that entertainment and politics could be mixed mm, mm. and he demonstrates what disastrous results that has yes um, one of the things that you write about in in the introduction is that sense of the patterns of history so the way that now speeches can be beamed all over the world and we can hear people saying them live almost as they happen obviously but of course some of the people in the book um, they're reported by a scribe, by a scribe, by a scribe, and what often only said, the great speeches, to a handful of people. So That's do you want right. to say a little bit about well, that, you know, when it's Tacitus and Yes, technology, and all of those technology has changed <clears throat> the importance of speech making. I mean, of course, when one used to think of you know, rhetoric as rather a sort of dusty, a dusty subject one did at boarding school um, about Cicero and Pericles. Um, the, the invention of the microphone changed everything. You know, before then, for the thousands of years of human life, before before the sort of late 19th century, speeches, Alexander the Great before his battles, or Henry V, they would be given before a battle to a handful of commanders and generals and officers, and they would then go and repeat the speech to the men at the battle. If you were speaking in the Athenian Ecclesia, the Senate, even Parliament, you know, only a few hundred people heard the speeches. The invention of the microphone, and then, of course, um, radio, and then television, and then the internet, have actually meant that speeches, whether they're video clips of speeches, reach thousands of people, millions of people within seconds. So speeches have never been more powerful, never been more important, never been more immediate. And yet in many ways, the education, the understanding of words and the power of words has never been more diminished. Mm -hmm. And so this book is just a small attempt to celebrate the great, um, to denigrate the atrocious and just to, to encourage everybody to, to enjoy words and realize that the most important thing, they're the most positive thing, and they can be the most dangerous thing. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you know it, and I'm sure the audience will know it. It reminded me of that extraordinary George Steiner novel, The Portage to San Cristobal of yes. A.H. And it's, uh, he was a great Jewish intellectual, George Steiner. And the whole story is about go and get this old man who's hiding in South America. It's the idea that it's A.H. is, is Hitler but don't let him speak. He must not be allowed to speak at all because if he speaks, he will persuade you. And that's really what you've gathered, these extraordinary words that persuade. Although there is, there, you know, there's some funny ones. I'm there thinking of, of the ones. Venezuelan dictator who really got in a bit of a tangle with his fishes and other well, uh, parts yeah, of the anatomy, yeah. but we won't go there. Um, so um, the we first one, um, Seabag, do you want to kick off and introduce the first letter that we're gonna hear today? Well, this is one of the classic letters in the book, of which, you know, which I mentioned. Um, there are some that everyone should know and many of you will be familiar with. And there are a lot of letters in the book you won't have heard of and you aren't familiar with and, and you should read. But this is one, this is the classic one. Um, I think this letter demonstrates two things. It's by Winston Churchill. It's his first letter as Prime Minister um, on May the 13th, 1940. Um, blood, toil, sweat, and tears and sweat. And it basically demonstrates that about war speeches. When, you're, when you give a war speech, you, if the war's already started, if the war hasn't started yet, you're beginning the war, obviously you, you prophesy, um, as Hitler did in his speeches, that you will conquer everybody, none of your people will be killed, and lots of the enemy will be killed. <laughs> but if the war's already started, and like Winston Churchill, you're, you're assuming power at really the depths of British fortunes, then you have, then this war speech is all about reducing expectations, and this mm. he does brilliantly in this speech, which is you know, a masterpiece written. He wrote it himself. Um, the words are beautiful. The, 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 the cadences, the, the repetitions in it of victory, victory, 
um, survival, um, and the rhythm, the sort of poetical rhythm, make this one of the great masterpieces. And if you're expecting me to say this is terribly relevant today because of Brexit, I think this speech demonstrates how 1940 bears no resemblance whatsoever to the crisis that we find ourselves in today. Okay. But let's enjoy the, wor this, the words of probably one of the greatest um, writers of, of speeches of all human history. In this crisis, I hope I may be pardoned if I do not address the House at any length today. And I hope that any of my friends and colleagues or former colleagues who are affected by the political reconstruction will make allowance for any lack of ceremony with which it has been necessary to act. I would say to the House, as I said to ministers who have joined the government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I can say, it is to wage war by sea, land, and air with all our might and with all the strength God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous tyranny, never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory. However long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. Let that be realised. No survival for the British Empire. No survival for all that the British Empire has stood for. No survival for the urge and impulse of the ages that mankind will move forward to its goal. But I take up my task with buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. At this time, I feel entitled to claim the aid of all, and I say, come then. Let us go forward together with our united strength. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I mean, although, Seabag, you say that, it, it, you know, it clearly where we are now and where that was in May 1940, these are very different times, there is at the same time a plangency about the nobility of those words and the sense of common purpose and values. Yes, I think, like, I think, you know, monstrous tyranny, unsurpassed in history, um, that is not hyperbolic. No. I mean, in fact, that, that was an accurate... And Churchill was one of the few people who, early, who earliest on in the 30s had realised that that was what you know, Europe, Europe and civilization was facing. And I think that that speech, um, that, so that speech, you know, is an ex is, it, though, it, though it, it deals in extremities of war and survival and, you know, and, and the odds could not be higher, um, you know, it isn't an example of loose language. It's a, it's, uh, and all his speeches were utterly controlled, um, so carefully written and, and, and delivered. Um, 
And you know, he knew it was one of the most, it was the most important speech of his life, probably. And he had to reset the entire tone of the war effort of the nation. And so, and it's all there in the words. Yes. And you know, I think one, one, one realizes it's just, when it's every word counts in that, yeah. means something, counts for something. There's no blather, there's no blowhard. It, the best speeches have grip, have acumen, have discipline. And um, you know, Link, Lincoln's, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is 200 words long or mm. something. You know, these, the greatest speech makers, the greatest speech writers, and Lincoln also wrote his own speeches, understand that it's all about control and also understanding the place, the audience, and the necessities of the time. Yes, and that, and that does all of them. You quoted it, you know, the Cicero that uh, brevity is the charm of eloquence. Brevity in some is the cases, charm of yes. eloquence. Um, now, the next one, I mean, that obviously the Churchill speech was when Britain's fortunes were low. The next one, we're going all the way back to 61 AD and a moment at which it looked as if triumph was in the hand. So can you explain the well, next letter you've chosen? Well, this is a Boudicca letter. This is also a, letter, a, letter, a, a speech of resistance. And Boudicca um, was, the, was the widow of a king of, the, a king of the Iceni, a tribe in Britain under Roman rule. The emperor is the emperor Nero. And the Roman administration has got more corrupt, more cruel under, under the, the, um, the power of ne the, the Neronian psychopath um, in Rome. Um, and gradually, um, more and more um, uh, Roman officials are persecuting the British tribes who had surrendered to Rome and had, you know, were Roman satellites, in fact. And when, when our husband dies, Boudicca's daughters are raped and the husband's fortune is stolen by Roman officials. And so she raises a rebellion. The speech she gives, I feel we may be under attack by Roman legions shut. now. Yeah, thank um, you. Yes. Um, the speech she gives thank you. Um, is an amazing speech. Now, you mentioned at the beginning that many of the speeches of the ancient world were written by scribes, by historians, may not be genuine. Um, but the ones I've chosen in this book, quite deliberately, are ones where the historian actually knew someone very close to um, the historical events. And in this case, Tacitus's father-in-law was on the staff of the Roman general who crushed the Iceni. So he would have spoken to people that attended this speech. It's a great woman's speech. It's a, it's a speech of female uh, resistance and defiance. It's a woman's resolve. It's a wonderful short, short speech. And I think it's very inspiring. It's also extremely modern. It is not as a woman descended from noble ancestry, but as one of the people that I am avenging lost freedom, my scourged body, the outraged chastity of my daughters. Roman lust has gone so far that not our very persons, nor even age or virginity are left unpolluted. But heaven is on the side of a righteous vengeance. A legion which dared to fight has perished. The rest are hiding themselves in their camp or thinking anxiously of flight. They will not sustain even the din and the shout of so many thousands, much less our charge and our blows. If you weigh well the strength of the armies and the causes of the war, you will see that in this battle, you must conquer or die. This is a woman's resolve. As for men, they may live and be slaves. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, with, with that, there, there is a terrible sadness in hearing those extraordinary words because history tells us that she then lost. So there was this moment where it looked as if she might triumph, and then that all went away. So that's yes. very powerful, the, 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 how important that moment is to capture the spirit. Yes, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's a wonderful speech, and the ending is beautiful, beautifully read. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I think speeches of resistance are, have, a special, yeah. um, have a special power and defiance, and especially when you know 
you know, the end, the end, the tragic end of, of the of the um, of the of, of Boadicea and the rebel and, yeah. and her rebellion. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think I think, and I think the next one is another sort of another in that sort of tradition in a yes. way. Yes, I mean the, the next one that um, we're we're going to share with you is Emmeline Pankhurst, um, which was November 1913. And it's very interesting that she is going to use the same sort of language of being a, a, a soldier. And the choice that was being posed was freedom or death. Now, of course, because we have just been celebrating the partial suffrage for women, and in 1928 there will be full suffrage for women, it's a lot more live in people's minds than maybe it would have been even five years ago, remembering quite how um, radical it was seen to suggest that women should be treated as human beings, which actually many of the women of the speeches that you do and letters, that's what it's saying, not treat us differently, treat us the same. And I think it's very uh, poignant that we're doing this particular one here, because if any of you have been around the, this beautiful and extraordinary estate, you might well have come to the letter house and seen the letters, some wonderful, some not so wonderful, sent to the first female, female um, MP, Nancy Astor. And if you haven't, go and read them, because they seem both terribly, terribly modern and terribly old-fashioned. So what we're going to hear is Natasha being Emmeline Pankhurst. I do not come here as an advocate, because whatever position the suffrage movement may occupy in the United States of America, in England, it has passed beyond the realm of advocacy, and it has entered into the sphere of practical politics. It has become the subject of revolution, and civil war. And so tonight, I'm not here to advocate women's suffrage. American suffragists can do that very well for themselves. I am here as a soldier who has temporarily left the field of battle in order to explain, it seems strange it should have to be explained, what civil war is like when civil war is waged by women. If I were a man, and I said to you, I come from a country which professes to have representative institutions and yet denies me, a taxpayer, an inhabitant of the country, representative rights. You would at once understand that that human being, being a man, was justified in the adoption of revolutionary methods to get representative institutions. But since I am a woman, it is necessary in the 20th century to explain why women have adopted revolutionary methods in order to win the rights of citizenship. Now, I want to say to you who think women cannot succeed, we have brought the government of England to this position, that it has to face this alternative. Either women are to be killed or women are to have the vote. I ask American men in this meeting, what would you say if in your state you were faced with that alternative? That you must either kill them or give them their citizenship. Women, many of whom you respect, women whom you know have lived useful lives, women whom you know even if you do not know them personally, are animated with the highest motives, women who are in pursuit of liberty and the power to do useful public service. Well, there is only one answer to that alternative. There is only one way out of it. Unless you are prepared to put back civilization two or three generations, you must give those women the vote. Now that is the outcome of our civil war. Thank you, Natasha. And I think what's so interesting about that is the reminder that two of the key things about women's partial suffrage um, were actually going to America to have the allies over there and sort of using people from outside the civil war to make it happen and the war itself because there was a suspension of the more violent parts of the protest for the suffragist and suffragette and it, moment. And it was actually the yeah. war itself that really actually won the changes yeah. rather than rather than Emmeline Pankhurst's campaign, which is a sort of, always a great irony of, of the whole story. Mm. But obviously, 
you know, that was a formidable speech, which was her, that was her kind of pitch speech. She traveled America on tour, giving that wherever she stopped. Mm. And um, so she must have known it pretty well by the end. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but it's power. It's like, it's like a book tour now, isn't it's it? It's like a book Go tour. Go and say the same thing in many tents yeah, yeah, all over exactly, the world. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, so the next one um, that we're going to share with you today is a really interesting example of when the person giving the speech, even though the speech is perfect and has been prepared, decides when they see their crowd to rip it up and do their own thing. And this is the now very famous, wonderful speech from Michelle Obama in April 2009 when she was in the UK and she went to the extraordinary school, Mulberry School, in East London, which has many uh, young women with a great deal to overcome before they even get into the classroom to do their learning and has the most extraordinary record of giving those girls opportunities and achievements. Um, and one of the young girls in the room, I didn't tell you this actually, the, who was there, who heard that speech, uh, later went to Oxford, and when Michelle Obama went to Oxford, she was the person chosen to introduce her. And that was an amazing moment of how one person can inspire. So we're going to ask Jade uh, to read that. Nothing in my life's path would have predicted that I'd be standing here as the first African-American First Lady of the United States of America. I am an example of what's possible when girls from the very beginning of their lives are loved and nurtured by the people around them. I was surrounded by extraordinary women in my life. Grandmothers, teachers, aunts, cousins, neighbours, who taught me about quiet strength and dignity. And my mother, the most important role model in my life, who lives with us at the White House and helps to care for our two little daughters, Malia and Sasha. She's an active presence in their lives, as well as mine, and is instilling in them the same values that she taught me and my brother. Things like compassion and integrity and confidence and perseverance. All of that wrapped up in an unconditional love that only a grandmother can give. I was also fortunate enough to be cherished and encouraged by some strong male role models as well, including my father, my brother, uncles and grandfathers. The men in my life taught me some important things as well. They taught me about what a respectful relationship should look like between men and women. They taught me about what a strong marriage feels like. That it's built on faith and commitment and an admiration for each other's unique gifts. They taught me about what it means to be a father and to raise a family. And not only to invest in your own home, but to reach out and help raise kids in the broader community. And these were the same qualities that I looked for in my own husband, Barack Obama. You are the women who will build the world as it should be. You are going to write the next chapter in history, not just for yourselves, but for your generation and generations to come. Please remember that. If you want to know the reason why I'm standing here, it's because of education. I never cut class. Sorry, I don't know if anyone's cutting class. I never did it. I loved getting A's. I liked being smart. I liked being on time. I liked getting my work done. I thought being smart was cooler than anything in the world. And you too, with these same values, can control your own destiny. Your success will be determined by your own fortitude, your own confidence, your own individual hard work. That is true. Everything you need to succeed, you already have right here. I hope in pursuing your dreams, you all remain resolute, that you go forward without limits, and that you use your talents to create the world as it should be. Because we are counting on every single one of you to be the very best that you can be. Because we need strong, smart, confident young women to stand up and take the reins. We know you can do it. We love you. Thank you so much. That one, wonderful, Jake. Um, that quiet strength and dignity. It's extraordinary. Yeah, and, it's, and, and also the power of an impromptu speech. You know, she ripped up, her, her staff had sort of prepared her a very boring speech. <laughs> 
in White House kind of, you know, White House um, language, and she just ripped it up and gave the speech that she wanted to give. And so that's an example of, of course, people going off, off their speeches um, can be disastrous, as Donald Trump has um, demonstrated. <laughs> you know, some people really should stick to the notes. Um, and he's about to be impeached as a result. But, um, but in this case, it went, it went really well. And, it, and it's a classic of its type. You know, it's a yeah. classic of its type. I, lo I love the sort of idea of it. Um, work hard, um, you know, and do your homework and don't miss class. Brilliant and beautifully okay. read. Thank okay. you. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, the evidence of what happens if you don't skip class. I mean, you know, it's hard to imagine doing better than that in some yeah. respect. Um, so the next letter yes. you've chosen actually is from a slightly different angle in the White House. Well, this is just a sort of this. This, I mean, I was always, I was never a great fan of the old, old George, or old George President George Bush forty one, President forty one, um, who seemed slightly uninspired and a slightly uninspiring leader. Um, the, the presidential campaign, when Bill Clinton challenged him, was was regarded then as incredibly vicious and um, yeah. and, and this cruel. is eight, 82, 90, 93. 92, 93. Yeah. and Bill yeah. Clinton won won the election, it was very bitter. George Bush was gonna be a one-term president, which is always a great humiliation for a sitting president. But when it came to the day he was handing over power, he left this letter um, on the desk in the White House. And it's only with time, looking back, um, in, with what we have now with Donald Trump, um, and, and realizing that even in the most sort of brutal politics, there is still space for civility, gentility, and also a respect for your nation, your institutions, and democracy itself, mm. rather than just a narcissistic, um, narcissistic self-obsession and self-promotion. Mm. And so I think you'll agree this is a classic letter, and, um, and one that says a lot about what we're missing today and what we can get back if we want. Dear Bill, when I walked into this office just now, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt four years ago. I know you will feel that too. I wish you great happiness here. I never felt the loneliness some presidents have described. There will be very tough times, made even more difficult by criticism you may not think is fair. I'm not a very good one to give advice, but just don't let the critics discourage you or push you off course. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success is now our country's success. I'm rooting hard for you. Good luck, George. I mean, I, I, I think it's also that sense of you can fundamentally disagree with somebody, but the common purpose is dignity and the good of all and a sense of public service, which is what that letter shows, doesn't it? But it all seems very old-fashioned now, doesn't it? We'll get it How back. How long ago it We're seems. We're going to get it back. How long ago it seems. Yeah, yeah. It um, seems. History so. is a pendulum, never yes. a straight road. That is the sad thing. So the next one, very, very different tone and from a very different point of view. Do you want to explain? Well, I think, it? I think the whole fun of, the, of a book like this is you don't just have great and noble and, um, and admirable statesmen um, giving political speeches, but you also want to have other. So we've got Muhammad Ali, the, the boxer, yeah. and this is this one is by Bob Dylan, and um, you know Bob Dylan is one of the one of those singer songwriters, rock stars who have changed the the, the way language is used with his, with his especially with his songs in the 60s, mm. um, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall and so on, um, and so this is his acceptance speech um, at when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And, and the original speech was rather long. <laughs> I think that came as a surprise to some people. <laughs> yeah. That, the original speech was incredibly long, because I think he was very good at writing song lyrics, um, but less good at editing um, uh, his own um, prose. But um, this is just, about, this is just a, 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 a speech about his inspiration. And it's all about literature. And let's hear it.
When I received this Nobel Prize for Literature, I got to wondering exactly how my songs related to literature. I wanted to reflect on it and see where the connection was. If I was to go back to the dawning of it all, I guess I'd have to start with Buddy Holly. Buddy died when I was 18 and he was 22. From the moment I first heard him, I felt akin. I felt related, like he was an older brother. I even thought I resembled him. Buddy played the music I loved, the music I grew up on. Country Western, rock and roll, rhythm and blues. Three separate strands of music that he intertwined and infused into one genre, one brand. And Buddy wrote songs, songs that had beautiful melodies and imaginative verses. And he sang great, sang in more than a few voices. He was the archetype, everything I wasn't and wanted to be. I saw him but only once, and that was a few days before he was gone. I had to travel a hundred miles to get to see him play and I wasn't disappointed. I think it was a day or two after that, his plane went down. And somebody, somebody I'd never seen before, handed me a lead belly record with the song Cotton Fields on it. And that record changed my life. It transported me into a world I'd never known. It was like an explosion went off, like I'd been Walking in darkness, and all of a sudden, the darkness was illuminated. It was like somebody laid hands on me. I must have played that record a hundred times. I had principles and sensibilities, and an informed view of the world. And I'd had that for a while. I learned it all at grammar school. Don Quixote, Ivanhoe, Robinson Crusoe, Gulliver's Travels, A Tale of Two Cities, all the rest, specific books that have stuck with me ever since I read them back in grammar school. I want to tell you about three of them. Moby Dick, All Quiet on the rest Western Front, and The Odyssey. So what does it all mean? When Odysseus in The Odyssey visits the famed warrior Achilles, in the underworld, Achilles, who traded a long life full of peace and contentment for a short one of honour and glory, he tells Odysseus, it was all a mistake. I just died, that's all. There was no honour, no immortality. And if he could go back, he would be a lowly slave to a tenant farmer on earth rather than be what he is, a king in the land of the dead. Whatever his life struggles were, they were preferable to being here, in this dead place. That's what songs are too. Our songs are alive. They're alive in the land of the living. But songs are unlike literature. They're meant to be sung, not read. The words in Shakespeare's plays were meant to be acted on stage. And I hope some of you get the chance to listen to these lyrics, the way they were intended to be heard, in concert, on record, or however people are listening to songs these days. I return once again to Homer, who says, Sing in me, O muse, and through me, tell the story. I, I really love the fact that at the moment you mentioned the underworld, there was this kind of zephyr that went through the tent as if, you know, somebody was rising up. Uh, one of the things that's so amazing about that um, is that going back to the idea of Michelle Obama and education, the idea that born Robert Zimmerman, 1941, in Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah. In that classroom, he was reading all of these books. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just a lovely celebration of the word 
And, of the, and uh, the key thing about speeches is, is coherence and a, and, a, and a clear message. And it's the same as a song, in fact. Mm. And so um, and Bob Dylan understands that. But really, it's just celebrating what we're all celebrating here today at Clifton, which is the word, you know, the yeah. importance yeah. Of, of reading uh, and, and the choice of words and the power of words. And that it doesn't matter whether you're listening or feeling or reading. Exactly. The, the, the word has its power, come what may. Now, one of the things you said at the beginning, you say in your introduction, Seabag, is that it is important to have some of the, dare I say it, the evil speeches from history that change things for the worse rather than the better. So we've got um, quite a sneaky one now, well, going I think, back in time. Yes, I think, well, I think it's just, I think, one, I think one, for those of you who are just suffocating under the sheer weight of goodness, and, um, and the sheer sort of, you, the, the sort of the, this blizzard of sort of virtue and wholesomeness. And decency. Here's, and decency. Yeah. Here's one for you. Um, <laughs> here is just a sort of short squirt of total evil that, um, to wake everybody up. Um, and this is, of course, from Genghis Khan. And um, Genghis Khan, uh, as you know, conquered the greatest empire between 1200 and 12, his death in 1227 the greatest empire the world still has ever known. Um, and um, you know, obviously, he was, he was a brilliant um, general, statesman, um, I, I, but, but he was also an utterly brutal character um, who believed in his brutality and believed it needed, his world dominion needed no excuse. And by the way, this, this I call it a speech, also could be, is also an example of table talk, is often quoted, and people often say like, this is just. This was just an invented. Um, this is just an invented speech that he that he was said to have given, made up much later. But in fact, it comes from the histories of Rashid al Din, who was the chief minister of the grandsons and, and great grandsons of Genghis Khan. So this isn't. This is something the family were very proud of, and it was handed down in the family. And what? And Genghis Khan liked to sit. They that these Mongol warlords drank an enormous amount, and and he used to when it, every when they were drunk enough, he'd he'd sort of bang the table and he'd say like, right, all my generals and sons, tell me what your greatest pleasure in life is. And they would all say things like they knew what they knew exactly what to say. They'd go hunting, or um, you know, or, or drinking, or something. And he'd go, "No, I'll tell you what it's all about." And this is what he said: <laughs> "The greatest pleasure and joy for a man is to crush." a rebel, and to defeat an enemy. Destroy him and take everything he possesses. Seize his married women and make them weep. Ride his fine and beautiful horses fornicate with his beautiful wives and daughters and possess them completely. Just a normal Sunday morning, ladies and gentlemen, at a literary festival. Um, we're, we're not going to take you right back to the light, but we are going to take you back to a more thoughtful place, possibly, than Genghis Khan. And this is uh, the wonderful TED Talk, which also was then quoted and used by Beyoncé, uh, from the Nigerian and American novelist Chimamanda um, Adichie. And Chimamanda published her first book when she was quite young, Purple Hibiscus, which was an extraordinary novel anyway. And then her next novel was Half of the Yellow Sun, which won the Women's Prize for Fiction and several other awards. And out of that, she got a MacArthur Award. I, you know, I don't know if you know this in America, when people who are just deemed to be wonderful thinkers are given half a million dollars, just because that's great, to be a fantastic thinker. And of course, then I would say her masterpiece, Americana, came out. And she has become not only an extraordinary novelist, which she always was, but a voice for women thinking about women in the world and what it means to be a woman in the world. And this TED Talk, 
um, was, I would say, as an old feminist, um, really part of the, the touch paper under a new generation of thinking and writing. And this TED Talk has been heard by many, many, many millions of people. Jade. Gender, as it functions today, is a grave injustice. I am angry. We should all be angry. Anger has a long history of bringing about positive change. But I am also hopeful because I believe deeply in the ability of human beings to remake themselves for the better. I would like today to ask that we should begin to dream about and plan for a different world, a fairer world, a world of happier men and happier women who are truer to themselves. And this is how we start. We must raise our daughters differently. We must also raise our sons differently. We do a great disservice to boys in how we raise them. We stifle the humanity of boys. We define masculinity in a very narrow way. Masculinity is a hard, small cage, and we put boys inside this cage. We teach boys to be afraid of fear, of weakness, of vulnerability. We teach them to mask their true selves because they have to be, in Nigerian speak, a hard man. But by far the worst thing we do to males, by making them feel they have to be hard, is that we leave them with very fragile egos. The harder a man feels compelled to be, the weaker his ego is. And then we do a much greater disservice to girls. We raise them to cater to the fragile egos of males. We teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller. We say to girls, you can have ambition, but not too much. You should aim to be successful, but not too successful. Otherwise, you will threaten the man. If you are the breadwinner in your relationship with a man, pretend that you are not, especially in public, otherwise you will emasculate him. But what if we question the premise itself? Why should a woman's success be a threat to a man? What if we decide to simply dispose of that word? And I don't know if there is an English word I dislike more than this, emasculation. We raise girls to see each other as competitors, not for jobs or accomplishments, which in my opinion can be a good thing, but for the attention of men. We teach girls that they cannot be sexual beings in the way boys are. We teach girls shame, close your legs, cover yourself. We make them feel as though by being born female, they are already guilty of something. The problem with gender is that it prescribes how we should be rather than recognizing how we are. Imagine how happier we would be, how much freer to our true individual selves if we didn't have the weight of gender expectations. And that's such a... I mean, that was such an important moment, that talk, but it's particularly hearing it after the Genghis Khan. Well, it does clear the air a bit after, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. after Genghis. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does. It does. It's lovely. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think, I think that's now become a classic. And th those podcasts, you know, just demonstrate how speeches have suddenly, just when we think, just when we thought books and speeches were sort of no longer important, suddenly they're reaching millions of people mm -hmm. again, and they really matter. Yes, because it's there that the nuances. It's there because the it's fled from the public space and That's all of right. that. That's right. That's yeah. right. Um, so the, the next uh, letter that um, that uh, Seabag's chosen is from Vita Sackville West of Virginia Woolf in January 1926. And this is a very different tone, but I, it seemed a very appropriate one to happen here at a literary festival. Because often, of course, we only see um, actors and writers as their public selves and the, you know, our works speak for us. But of course, we're human too. And so this is, you know, Virginia Woolf is such an important writer, but here we see her being, you know, in the words of Notting Hill or whatever, just a girl standing in front of a girl, obviously, and asking her to love her. So yeah, I mean, you, why did you choose this sea bag before we hear the letter? Well, I mean, in the, the, the letters book is full of um, great love letters 
and um, you know some of them are, some of them um, are well known, um, like Nelson and and uh, and Lady Hamilton, mm. um, Catherine the Great and Prince Potemkin, um, and some of them are and, and, and you know, my favourites are Nias Nin and Henry Miller. A lot of them are very erotic. Um, we've got we've got some gay love letters. Um, we've got um, we've got James the First and the Duke of Buckingham, um, quite a saucy one from him. And we've got this slightly sapphic, slightly sa very sapphic um, love letter. So I just think this is such a touching um, letter. It's got so many nuances. It's not just about passion. It's about longing, and it's about the insecurity that everyone feels in any love affair. Mm. And I think that's its, that's its delight, and why it's one of the greatest letters ever written, and it's timeless. Natasha. But, um, just to um, illustrate, it's from Beta to Virginia, not Virginia. Oh, did I do it the other? Just in case there's any confusion. Well, <laughs> yes. right. So, well, um, thank you. Milan, Thursday, January the 21st, 1926. I am reduced to a thing that wants Virginia. I composed a beautiful letter to you in the sleepless nightmare hours of the night, and it's all gone. I just miss you in a quite simple, desperate, human way. You, with all your undumb letters, would never write so elementary a phrase as that. Perhaps you wouldn't even feel it. And yet, I believe you'll be sensible of a little gap, but you'd clothe it in so exquisite a phrase that it would lose a little of its reality. Whereas with me, it's quite stark. I miss you even more than I could have believed. And I was prepared to miss you a good deal. So this letter is really just a squeal of pain. It's incredible how essential to me you have become. I suppose you are accustomed to people saying these things. Damn you, spoilt creature. I shan't make you love me any more by giving myself away like this. But oh, my dear, I, I can't be clever and standoffish with you. I love you too much for that, too truly. You have no idea how standoffish I can be with people I don't love. I have brought it to a fine art. But you have broken down my defenses, and I don't really resent it. Please forgive me for writing such a miserable letter, V. <laughs> Yes, thank you. That's, that's me getting my, my Virginias and my Vitas in a tangle. Um, so, as we were saying, one of the things when we were practicing earlier, listening to the beautiful readings, and we did feel that maybe we were just being a tiny bit too sunny, um, given the amazing selection of letters in the book and the speeches in the book. So, Seabag decided he was just going to nip in with another illustration of how we can all be manipulated, shall we say? Yes, well, I just, I just, thought, I just thought it'd be fun, because I, I love these very, very short speeches, um, like the Genghis Khan one. This is slightly different. It's not as brutal. Um, this is by the caliph, Muawiyah, who ruled the Arab Islamic Empire, 660 to 680. And you've got to realize, this man was the most powerful man in the world. He ruled from the borders of Morocco to the borders of India. So a, a colossal empire, almost unimaginable. And he regarded himself not as what we would now think of as a sort of fundamentalist Muslim, but he regarded himself as a cross between a sort of Arab desert sheikh and a, and a Roman Caesar. And he was very, very admiring of the Roman em empire. And he was the founder of the Umayyad dynasty. And he had a saying that he always used to say um, when he was faced, when he was sort of, again, talking to his court and talking about how to rule and the art of pragmatism, the art of being a great politician. And again, in our extreme times, there's something we can learn from this very wise three or four line um, explanation he gave. And this is basically Muawiyah's art of politics. This is, he says, this is how to rule. And I'll just read out his very short advice. He said, I do not apply my sword when my lash suffices. And I do not apply my lash when my tongue is enough. And even if there's one hair binding me to my fellow man, I do not let it break. When I pull, 
they loosen. And when they loosen, I pull. There we are. <laughs> Before, before we hear the, the very last um, extract from one of the speeches, when you were putting this, this book together, well, both of them, but particularly the speeches, um, how did you possibly decide what to put in? And what was the biggest surprise? You know, did people say, oh, you must go and look at that one? And then you were sort of blown away by something that you found. Um, yeah, I, I, wanted to have surprising, I wanted to have surprising speeches. I didn't just want to have, I wanted to have all the essential ones, of course, and it's got all of those, which we've, which we've discussed, Martin Luther King. Um, but it's also, there are many speeches which are sort of in the, public, uh, in the public realm, and yet people don't know the speech. For example, you know, I don't know how many of you love Evita, for example, and you remember the great speech, the great song in the musical, um, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Mm. Well, I've got the real speech in here. Um, that she actually gave from the Casa Rosada. Mm. So, and I, I think, which I think is rather fun to hear. And of course, it won't surprise you to know that it is despicable demagoguery yes. um, at its worst. Um, but it's very fascinating and yet read, interesting to read it. Um, another fascinating one, which is always relevant, you know, is Nixon's, the speech Nixon gave, um, they'll never write a book about my mother. And this very bitter speech he gives as he resigns to his staff. And it is an extraordinary speech. Um, so there's, 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 there's a mixture of things. And I mentioned, then I mentioned sort of you know, che really cheerful ones like Muhammad Ali's kind of great, um, he called, they, they, at the time it was called trash talking. Um, but now we'd call it kind of rap, really, I think. You know? And he was like, they're so funny. They're, so, they're, 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 they're sort of poetry. Mm. And, um, but he used to sort of prepare them before he went out, before a fight. And so I've, we've got those. And then, as, then there is, of course, you know, rank evil. You know, and spe there are speeches in here you won't see in any other anthology. Um, for example, um, there's, a, there's, there's a speech by Heinrich Himmler, which he gave to the people, to his officers in the SS, who were perpetrating the Holocaust. And he gave this very this, this secret speech to them, telling them that they were doing nightly duty for the German people by doing, perpetrating the Shoah and the destruction of the Jewish people. And it's a sort of speech like I would never have thought to put in here, but given what's happening in the world and even happening in England um, with anti-Semitism today, mm. these are speeches that we people need to know about. So there's a lot of fun. There are speeches by dreamers. There are speeches by killers. Some are noble and exquisite. Some are disgusting and atrocious. All human life is here. Mm. And we're going to um, well, finish, and, and Seabag will introduce the last one, but we're going to let you go out with those words in your mind. So before we do that, I just want to say that both of these books are available to buy. Um, and then you will hear all of these, and Seabag will be signing in the bookshop, which is just around there afterwards. Um, but I'd like you to join together uh, to say an enormous thank you to Intelligence Squared, who in these very difficult times where some of the people that one would like to look to for guidance and thought are falling rather short of that. To have an organisation like Intelligence Squares, which keeps putting thinking and debate and dialogue in front of us, is very, very welcome. Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, this extraordinary festival, uh, the Cliveden Literary Festival. I've never been before, and it is a, a total treat. And again, I think the fact that we've all been able to sit here and celebrate words and books and listen to people with different points of view, and then everybody goes, and has a glass of champagne. This seems to me how the world uh, should work. But I'd particularly um, like to thank the extraordinary actors who brought these uh, speeches from all of history to life. Natasha McElone, uh, Alex McQueen, and Jade Anuka. And of course, Siva. So, do you want to explain the final letter that well, we're the, going to the, hear? The final letter is a classic. Malala was the, was the Pakistani girl shot in the head by the Taliban for, um, for seeking an education, for reading books. And as you, as you know, she recovered. She's one of the people who really demonstrates the sort of new power of words, you know, the, per, the, the way that nowadays through a podcast or a speech, through television and the internet, people are reaching audiences that Cicero and Pericles could never have imagined, millions of people within seconds. And some of them can be, some of them can be disastrous, and some of them can be very constructive and admirable and, and totally noble. 
And this celebration of words and letters and the pen is mightier than the sword by Malala at the United Nations is a classic. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, today it is an honor for me to be speaking again after a long time. Here I stand, one girl among many. I speak not for myself, but for all girls and boys. I raise up my voice, not so that I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. Those who have fought for their rights, their right to live in peace, their right to be treated with dignity, their right to equality of opportunity, their right to be educated. Dear friends, on the 9th of October, 2012, the Taliban shot me in the left side of my forehead. They shot my friends too. They thought the bullets would silence us, but they failed. And then out of that silence came thousands of voices. The terrorists thought that they would change our aims and stop our ambitions, but nothing changed in my life except this. Weakness, fear, and hopelessness died. Strength, power, and courage was born. I am the same, Malala. My ambitions are the same. My hopes are the same. My dreams are the same. Dear sisters and brothers, we realize the importance of light when we see darkness. We realize the importance of our voices when we are silenced. In the same way, when we were at Swat in the north of Pakistan, we realized the importance of pens and books when we saw the guns. The wise saying, the pen is mightier than sword, was true. The extremists are afraid of books and pens. The power of education frightens them. They are afraid of women. The power of the voice of women frightens them. That is why they are blasting schools every day. So let us wage a global struggle against illiteracy, poverty, and terrorism, and let us pick up our books and pens. They are our most powerful weapons. One child, one teacher, one pen, and one book can change the world. Education is the only solution. Education first. Well done.